This episode is brought to you in part by Signature Doors and Windows, Modern in Denver Magazine, and Daniel Jenkins Photography. It's almost like this laboratory where different people are coming in and with their clients and trying new things. And I think that in isolation is kind of interesting versus seeing it as needing to conform to whatever out in modern is. Hi. Hello. 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 Hello, and welcome to Architecting. Hi, welcome to Architecting. This is Rebecca Wagner here with the Ellis Datum. Uh, for, hey, how's it going? H- how are you? How are you doing? Not great. <laughs> what's uh, what's up with your voice today? Yeah, I got my tonsils taken out a week ago, and I'm still struggling. Yeah, you you're really not doing great. Uh I've seen I've seen the pain. Yeah, I would 100% not recommend this to anyone. It's it's no fun. Yeah. Yeah, I I I'd say I I won't make you talk very much, but this is the third time I've had you record this introduction. Yep, and you got me out of bed again. So, there's that. But hey, Adam, who's on the podcast tonight? Yeah, so as a treat to you, we have a good podcast that you can listen to while you're in pain recovery. Mm. So today we have we have Jason Rowe and Zach Rocket from Row Rocket Design on the podcast. And yeah, I've been following Row Rocket's work on Instagram for a while and loving what they're doing. But I have a confession to make and be so I don't get a bunch of hate mail from my listeners. These guys are California based firm. <laughs> yeah. And like most Californians moving to Colorado now, but now they're they're having a, a color they have a Colorado office as well in Aspen. Oh, okay. It's acceptable. <laughs> it's acceptable. But one of their employees who's helping set up that office in Aspen reached out, Morgan Brown, who also went to Kansas State University like us and is a is a fan of the show. And I was, I was thankful for him to to help set this interview up and this talk because I really enjoyed the time talking with these guys. So they have an interesting path coming together. Literally, their their last names were right next to each other and they were standing in alphabetical order on the first day of, of grad school at Harvard and met and took them off on this path. And that became their firm name? Yeah. Grow Rocket. Pretty cool. Yeah, interesting experience. Worked or worked for or studied studied under architects like uh, Renzo Piano, Iwamoto Scott, Jeannie Gang, and Wes Jones, uh, among others. And and you know we just got into some good stuff about how they started the firm, how they're how they're how they're running the firm together. And the the sort of balance that they're they're striking with their two personalities and just with the two kind of different aspects of architecture, the kind of problem solving side and the and the artistic expression side. And overall just just making good projects and uh good another good learning experience for me with these two guys. Sounds good. Wanna listen? Yeah, I'll I'll hopefully I won't make you do four takes tonight. I think this is a good one. And uh, yeah, enjoy it. Thanks. But first, here's a few messages from our sponsors. This episode of Architecting is brought to you in part by me, Daniel Jenkins of Daniel Jenkins Photography, specializing in architectural design and travel photography. Based right here in Denver and with experience working throughout North America and Europe, my detailed yet minimalistic approach to photography aims to tell a story while capturing the beauty and authenticity of time and place. To learn more or to inquire regarding services and availability, visit my website, danielscottjenkins.com. That's danielscottjenkins.com. Or follow along and reach out to me on Instagram. My handle is at danielscottjenkins. Thank you, and now back to the show. Yeah, hey Zach, how's it going? Hey Adam, great. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. It's always funny, like uh, like meeting people for the first time and like being recorded doing it. But uh, it, it is fun. It's like 
those things you discover the very first time with people. It's like, I, I wish I had more of those recorded, you know, uh, I could go back to it and check it out. But yeah. Where are you guys calling in from? I'm in LA. Okay. Yep. Both, both LA. And I'm, I'm up in the Bay area. Oh, you are good. Okay. No, we we're in two different locations. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is actually our reality is connecting uh, digitally over the screens. Yeah, we have a studio um, in the Bay Area uh, in a town called Sausalito, just north of San Francisco, in Marin County. So that's where I've, I've been since we started. Um, and Jason has been in Southern California uh, in Los Angeles. Nice. I'm, I'm super interested to hear that origin story and ha- how that's worked out for you. My business partner is in Connecticut, and so we kind of have the same same thing going on. I guess you guys might be a little easier to jump on a plane or drive up to each other but yeah i want to i want to hear i want to hear the the special sauce that makes that work but uh i'll make you guys do the only like set question in the beginning here the hard one oh they no look they're in the same spot now yeah so who are you guys in two sentences and you can take that as a team or you can take it individual let's judge the partnership here have you done your homework zach <laughs> It's like a party sketch. Well, it's like the um, fewest the fewest words, you know, can win sometimes. So pers- sorry, personally or as a as a as a practice. I, I think that's I'm interested to see where you take that. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say personally, but if you want to take it as kind of a partnership. Yeah. Or maybe I I've have- never had this as a partnership. You could answer for the other person, maybe, and see how close you are. Uh <laughs> all right. Who's gonna go? I would say we're uh, we're a, we're a pair of architects working on uh kind of projects together. Um, so we, we say thing like kind of on one of our little blurbs is that we're, we're a group of folks kind of scattered across the country, but we work collaboratively, collaboratively as one. Um, that's, that's kind of a line we often use. I think in addition to that, both Jason and I are to answer for him. We're both fathers, right? Um, we're both, we're partners together in this practice, but we're we, we separately have uh, families of our own. Um, so I think that defines us as well. Um, and we try to kind of strike this work-life balance uh, that's often a challenge uh, in the architecture profession. Yeah. Yeah. I gave you a much more succinct answer. I think we are relentless with design and practical with execution. I think we have this, in- just to expand on that, I think we... We can't let go of either side, even when they're sometimes diametrically opposite of each other. And if I tie it back to start getting back to an origin story, when we started together, Zach was practicing with uh, Nathan Darling and doing really beautiful, uh, sophisticated, high-end residential work. And I was in New York City working on the lowest budget multifamily projects, you know, in like... East Harlem at the time, which you know, has gotten to be net nicer. But, and so we're trying to then bring those two like experiences together to create really beautiful but buildable projects. And I think it, it made for a, a nice mix of initial sensibilities. Yeah, nice. I like that you, you, you did do your homework with that, that one sentence thing. So let's, Jason, let's start with you. So where, where did that, that come from? Where did you kind of grow up and what did you grow up around that kind of cultivated that that background for you? Yeah, sure. I, I grew up in, well, my parents immigrated separately from South Korea to Ohio. Hmm. And Ohio of all places, they were studying there. They, they were pursuing their education. They met there. They, um, they started our family. And so I lived in Cleveland from zero to nine. And, um, you know, pretty great childhood and pretty like any, any other. And moved back to Korea and went to hmm. international school there. So big, big cultural shift, big urban setting, you know, at the time still sort of developing country and went to international school all the way through high school. So when when did you move there? I moved in 1986. I was oh, nine at the time, in fourth grade. Uh-huh. And moved back in the summers. And, and then I came back for college. I was in Philadelphia, then New York. In Boston, where Zach and I met for grad school. Yeah, well, I was going to say, like, what what did your parents study? Like, what were you around growing sure. up? Sure, my dad was an engineer. It was uh, he studied. Uh, he was a material scientist. He studied mm-hmm. metals, and so he was kind of in the lab, developing alloys, and you know, working for uh, in the automotive industry. 
And my mother was a librarian by training. And by the time she had us, she had stopped working to, to raise us. And then actually, I think she had a little bit of an entrepreneurial bug in her and she opened up a teddy bear store of all things in downtown Cleveland. So, you know, we were around, you know, we lived in a, a nice little neighborhood, a lot of old homes. Like, you know, if we start to inch towards architecture, it was a lot of traditional colonial Italian ed, like just really old turn of the century type architecture around. And it was Cleveland, so there was nothing super progressive or modern about it. But somehow architecture and design, um, not that I look back, it, it sort of crept in small ways. I think through my mother, like you look at, you go to Crane and Burial and you see, you know, they bring back like the dance stuff and some of the uh, Danish design things. And you can start, I can start to recall like little, like, oh yeah, these Helmer cups or this like, little dance pot. And, and maybe it was through my mother that there was like a little bit of like influence there. I don't know. Well, I like, I like that from your first thing of the the practicality and the, the design rigor. And that's the material science and the teddy bear store. Like it's this, yeah. like architecture right there, the teddy bear store and the, and the material science. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a few good schools in Ohio for architecture. Where did you go to Penn? Is that, or? And went back and then we Penn for undergrad. How'd you land there? And how'd you know you wanted to do architecture then? Um, I did not know that I wanted to do architecture until very late in college. I think the first time I flirted with the idea of design, and it wasn't even design, it was an architect. It was, I was trying to decide what to do, where to apply. And I, one of my dad's buddies, uh, we were having dinner and he was kind of asking me what my plans were. And he just kind of made a blanket suggestion that I pursue something that had a certificate, a license or some sort of certification, you know, in terms of a qualification that I could carry with me wherever I went, you know, and at the time his angle was, to be honest, was, hey, look, you're, you're going to be a minority there. So get a skill or some sort of certification that you can show for, and that's non-negotiable. So I did a summer program at the GSD uh, called Career Discovery, mm. and just was a six, uh, I think it was a three or six week program uh, as a high schooler. I think I was one of two high schoolers there. And it was a lot of fun, but I decided I wasn't quite sure and see what else. So Penn was really just for me, fell in love with the campus when I toured it and was lucky enough to get in. And so I just went there not knowing what I wanted to do. I uh, started as a music major because I played cello and uh, a number of other instruments and piano and sax and um, wanted to be a composer and conductor. Mm. My my skills were lacking. Quit piano too early, regrettably, and was a finance major because I didn't know what else I wanted to do. And all my other buddies were talking about going into investment banking, mm. and but then heard about a studio major there. It wasn't even an architecture major, and I uh, took a class with my roommate James at the time, and we both really liked it. Uh, he ended up dropping out, but I it just I just caught the bug, and it was clear where my interests lie. So I s- stayed on with that, and ended up interning and then working for my professor. Hmm. So that was coursing set you off. Yeah, so, Zach. What what about you? What's the kind of background that led you where you're at? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of a obviously a different story, I guess, since these things tend to happen. But I was uh, I was in Texas and Oklahoma, so I hmm. was. Um, kind of kicking around a more probably rural childhood um, than what Jason just described uh, in, in and around Cleveland. But for me, it was, uh, my dad was in grad school at UT Austin when I was mm-hmm. born. So I was actually born <clears throat> in Austin um, and was there for a few years. But then we moved back to kind of where the family was from, which was um, uh, central Oklahoma. And, mm-hmm. you know, kind of enjoyed a very simple rural childhood And I think, you know, early on, some of my kind of nascent architectural interests were, uh, you know, centered around construction sites and scrap piles. So my, you know, neighbor friends and I would would scramble around the neighborhood, you know, scavenging for pieces of plywood and and cut off two by fours. And we would always bring them back to my house and, and that would kind of turn into something. And so that was maybe a little bit of a seed of things to come, but we moved to Chicago um, hmm. in the late eighties. And so went from a kind of scattered, super casual, uh, rural setting to, to a suburb of Chicago. And that's where I kind of plugged into middle school and high school. 
um, and things, you know, kind of operated at a different, at a different pace. But from there ended up, you know, kind of on a Midwestern track to a large state school and headed to a, a university in Ohio uh, called Miami University, mm. kind of Southwestern Ohio. And they yeah. had an architecture program, which I signed up for as a, as a freshman um, and kind of plugged in plug in uh, as a freshman at that campus and, and kind of went through their four-year degree and we uh, got out of that program. It was, you know, a great kind of small design community uh, with a, a lot of good kind of quiet architecture professors that, that had a lot of good things to say and ended up moving to Colorado shape from there hmm. and, and come to get my first job in the mountains uh, with an architect. Hmm. What was your father studying? What did, what did he do or your parents? He was a sociology major. Huh. He had a doctorate in sociology. And my mom was uh, a homemaker. Uh, so she was, she was there raising my sister and I. And she was always doing something interesting kind of on the side. But yeah, that, that was their background. Nothing particularly architectural, but certainly there was a lot of creative energy uh, around the house. You know, it was, very, it was a very DIY use if you will i mean we were we were you know my parents always had a project going on we built a house when i was probably six or so uh which was an early memory kind of stomping around the construction site you know learning to to flip over boards that have nails sticking up that was one of my early memories is, is being on that construction site and stepping on a board with a, with a nail sticking up and it both literally stuck with me and figuratively stuck with me for yeah. my life yeah think about that memory a lot that's funny so then, but it was, a, it was a pretty direct path for you to, to study architecture or was it sort of seems good and let's try it out or. Yeah. I mean, I think it was kind of a lucky, you know, happenstance type of path. I, through high school was pursued some art classes. There was never a drafting class or an architecture class, but I always seemed to have some sort of art class um, hanging on, you know, along with the rest of the prerequisites. So that was an early interest. And I think probably we looked into it on a, on a visit and met with the, uh, the chair, I believe at the time. And he said, oh yeah, come back with a portfolio. So, you know, I, I think I went back after an early college visit, put a portfolio of kind of artistic things together and sent it off to them. And, and they said, yeah, you know, let's, let's get you signed up. So it was kind of that straightforward. And I don't know that there was a whole lot of intentionality behind it, but it was kind of a, uh, you know, you're, you're 18 or however you, old you are. And, that seems like an interesting path and, and you give it a shot and it really stuck, you know, kind of out of the gates. Uh, it felt like, you know, I was with the right people in the right place. So from there, it just kind of grew. Yeah. And then who'd you work for in Colorado? I worked for um, a guy by the name of Tim Hagman, Hagman Architect uh, in Aspen. And yeah, he was with uh, a guy by the name of Larry Yaw for years. Oh yeah. So there was a firm called Hagman Yaw, uh, and that firm is still, still, still a very successful practice in the Aspen area. But yeah, I worked for Tim. It was an office of about I don't know twelve or fifteen people. And I looked for him for about two or three years right out of undergrad, and you know it was a great, you know, great first architecture job, if you will. I mean, it was it was you were working on a lot of residential projects, a lot of great detailing in a great and wonderful place where there was lots of work at the time. But after about three years of being in that studio, I decided I wanted to go get a graduate degree, get a master's. So that's uh, started applying to grad schools around the country. And as Jason mentioned, uh, we both ended up at the GSD uh, in Boston. And so I kind of unplugged from, from Colorado at that time and, and moved to Boston and started that. Yeah. Jason, how, how long was it between undergrad and grad for you? Not long. It was two years, I think. We I took a fifth year in college to finish. I worked for two, asked for a raise, and they said they couldn't pay me more than a grad student. So figured I'd go back to grad school. <laughs> so it was it was a relatively short period of time, but it was at a smaller office and was able to learn and and touch and see and do a lot. So went back, and it was two thousand two that we went back to grad school, Zach. Um, and then it was that that yeah. first day of orientation just love at first sight just like hey let's let's start something here and uh so you were in the same class together the same kind of starting class well the you know 
Yeah, the last names, Row and Rocket, right? They share the first two letters. And so that first day, I mean, you're literally lining up, I think, when you arrive oh. to get your, your folder packet of information. And so Jason, you know, I was standing right behind Jason in line because <laughs> we had kind of, I guess, you know, gone to the, gone to the R section. He turned around and, you know, introduced himself. So I think probably quite literally might have been the first person I met on the GSD campus by virtue of just our names. Yeah, we ended up landing in the first studio together, which was pretty interesting. That's funny. I was going to say, Jason, did you just search out the guy who had the the most badass name for a firm? And <laughs> yeah, it's been, yeah it's, let's do it. Yeah, exactly. He does have a better and a cooler last name. That's for sure. <laughs> the other thing is, I think in our class, which was about seventy or so students, I think we were the only two. Like, I had just gotten married that summer. Mm. It was uh, like Mary and go to Boston together or good luck kind of thing. And Zach was, I think, freshly engaged. So mm-hmm. we were the, the only two sort of adults in the room at the time. And even in our studio, I don't think anybody had worked prior to entering the hmm. program. So, you know, we, we had a little bit of experience. So I think we were sort of on a similar thought wavelength. You know, we all struggled. Everyone struggled. Yeah kind of a, same, a similar mental place. And so uh, I think there was a connection there to just having our significant other and spouses be able to distract themselves while we were off working was was really beneficial. That's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. Like I, I was the same way. I had a wife in grad school and it does make a difference. It, it kind of, it changes your priorities a little bit, at least skews you to trying to spend less time in there, or at least yeah. have someone that can take care of you a little better. And my wife at least kind of became like the studio mom in some ways of like cooking big patches of chili and like bringing it in and like cookies and things like that. But so you guys did the, like a three-year program there. Was that right? Or it was, yeah. That's great. And um, yeah, it was a three, three-year program. So you were coming in, uh, obviously had architecture degrees already. You, you probably had a certain expectation or understanding of what you thought it would be like. What were some of the things that, that kind of surprised you about that that education and that track that you, you didn't expect going in? Well, the first studio was, for me, I don't know about you, Zach, was a little bit of a surprise. We had a, a, an instructor who was a little bit more rooted in the traditional like form of architectural instruction. Hmm. His name was Marco Steinberger. Steinberg. Hmm. And, you know, we, we drew a hand the entire semester, if I if I recall correctly. And it was, I think, probably looked at it so backwards at the, la- the final review. One of the critics, who was a core professor there, literally stopped and said, why, why are you guys drawing my head? Like, why are you wasting your time? Like, what's the point of this? <laughs> like, uh, so, and I, I sort of took a whoop in that semester. I mm. remember and the professor came over and just was like, just make sure everything's going all right with you. Like, you know, things... You know, are there issues at home or what? Because, you know, I wasn't even finishing my projects. I was mm. sitting there just kind of struggling. But that was a little different than what I expected. I think there was a, a thought that you'd sort of breeze through at least the first half and, you know, just be there as everyone else got up to speed. But it was challenging in its own right. I don't know, Zach. It was super hands-on, actually, which I wasn't really expecting. To Jason's point, a lot of those first projects were hand-drawn, um, which I secretly loved. You know, and still wish we were we were drawing by hand sometimes, mm-hmm. someday. Mm-hmm. But we were also making a ton of models. I mean, there, it was a production-oriented studio, I would say. So, you know, the expectation was that you were cranking through iterations after iteration after iteration you know, multiple study models, multiple, you know, sets of drawings. And I, yeah, I definitely did not expect that out of the gates, but I think it was a great, like, just exploration, a great, like, exploratory studio where you were finding form and you were, you know, testing materials and kind of inventing things through making. So he would, you know, request that we use pretty standard materials and, you know, be inventive with them. And I think, that kind of set a good tone uh, relative to the, you know, what was to come at the GSD. But I think it was a, it was a good intro. It was, it was a pretty heavy duty level of commitment, you know, as, as I know, a lot of these schools are across the country, but there was, it set a certain tone for expectations, I think, moving forward. Yeah. So then 
did you have kind of like advanced studios like the last two semesters or is that how it worked or was it a kind of a thesis? It was more of a thesis? No, you did a core set of studios for the first two years, I believe, or for maybe just, yeah, one or first one or two years. So there's a core set of faculty and then you get into option studios. Um, mm -hmm. And the option studios were pretty spectacular. I mean, you've got great architects around the world plugging into that place, teaching a studio. So you're exposed, you know, to a lot of great ideas, a lot of different ways of doing things while you're there, which I think is one of its greatest assets is that, you know, they can bring in, you know, folks from, you know, global leaders in the architectural world and, and you can sit there and listen to them talk or, you know, be taught by them. And I think that was, you know, a great kind of foundation to get for youngsters that were looking to go out and, and then plug into either some of these practices or think about doing something on their own to have been exposed to, you know, other people that have been doing that and have been very successful doing that. You know, I think that was, for me, one of the best takeaways from that experience. Yeah. So who, who did you guys have? Like, who, who was kind of the most influential and set you up for afterwards? Hmm. For our option studio, I, I study. I had took one with Genie Gang, and this mm -hmm. was before Studio Gang kind of blew out. Right? Yeah, um, and it was it was in New York City. And she had just done kind of published something about speculated about stadiums on top of office towers, and so it was a stadium in the city studio. Mm -hmm. That was kind of influential in that it was nice to see an architect really humble, really just. Mm -hmm very genuine as a person. And you had people who were all talking up here about architecture and she would just kind of sit down and we would just talk about architecture and just utter plain speak, you know? Mm. And it was, it was kind of nice to, to do that and just talk about very simple things like, okay, how, how am I going to get there? And what's that experience going to be or whatever it might be. So it was kind of inspiring in that way. And then, really interesting to then see the firm ascend and be like, oh, I saw them before they were like superstars. And, yeah. And try to observe, okay, so what, what steps did they take? Um, the other studio was with Peter Rose, who, you know, was, was kind of like the seasoned uncle, you know, <laughs> there the, and he, he was very obsessive about craft and detail and beauty and, um, you know, would sit there and just you know, hand in his face and just, sketch over detail over detail together and and really passionate about the things that he was passionate about so i think it was those were you know i didn't really get the like superstars but i think i got some really great insight and observation through them yeah and like an interesting balance there yeah, yeah. what about you zach what who was influential well, interestingly, I ran, I ran into one of them last night, um, yeah, yeah. but one of my uh, option studios was with um, Craig Scott and Lisa Iwamoto, uh, mm. Iwamoto Scott. They had an interesting studio set in San Francisco, and ran, I ran into Craig last night. We were at a AIA thing together and, you know, walked up and shook his hand and we were chatting and, you know, kind of lamenting the fact that that was now kind of close to 20 years ago. But it's fun to see those guys taking off and doing really well with larger and larger projects around the world. Uh, but they were, you know, they were great to to learn from and and to kind of be a part, yeah, you know, be a part of their their world. We did a trip out to to San Francisco to the site we were working on. I remember when we was in that studio, and you know, they just ran in an interesting group of folks when we got to when we got to the city. So they were bringing in other architects and you know, going out to dinners and just kind of being exposed to some some cool stuff around the city. The other one I had was Wes Jones. Uh, oh, great, cool. Um, huh. Architect based in LA and just a great thinker, really, you know, kind of arguing, making an argument for, for re re refinement, big Mies van der Rohe fan. So kind of coming at it through a, a slightly different lens, maybe more like a traditional modern lens, but, you know, stressing, stressing craft, really stressing drawings but really stressing kind of doing it over and over again and really kind of trying to excel at doing the little things really well instead of trying to always be re, you know, reinventing the wheel. So he was, he was pretty influential. The other thing that happened at the GSD for me was there was a, a partnership that Renzo Piano had set up with the GSD where you could apply for uh, an internship at his studio. So I went through that process 
and was fortunate enough to, to kind of get invited to his studio in Italy for a semester. So mm. you kind of have to put your studies on pause. But I, so I kind of un- unplugged for a semester and went and worked in his office in Genoa, which was probably one of the more influential or impactful pieces that I got out of grad school was just kind of parking it in his office for in that fantastic building. Yeah. 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 Amazing. Amazing building. You know, uh, you know, on on this bluff overlooking the Mediterranean, (laughs) if you've been fortunate enough to go check it out. I I haven't been there. No, but I've been, yeah, the pictures, but yeah. Yeah. So you, I mean, you arrive, you know, down at that sea level and you, you know, you, you walk up and push a button on this, this glass funicular. (laughs) Right. And, so you step foot in this glass box and, you know, push another button and up you go. And so you rise, on, you know, on this, on this funicular, you know, through this amazing garden that he's planted in these series of terrace hmm. gardens. And there's a point at which you've got these canvas director chairs, you know, really simple chairs, oh. four or six of them sitting in this cab. And if you're smart, you pick, you pick the right seat. Because as you're as you're going up kind of diagonally through this garden, there's a point at which you get up above the trees and then it's just this like spectacular view out over the Mediterranean. And then yeah, you 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 know, his office is this it's kind of modeled after these northern Italian greenhouses that are scattered across the landscape. So inside the office is another series of these terraces. So each there I think are three different, three or four different levels within the studio, and then it's all under one big roof. So you're sitting at your desk and I've had this glass roof sloping over you with these kind of aluminum blades that you can open and close. Hmm. Um, so you're just kind of sitting there working and, you know, there's this cargo ship kind of slowly moving across the horizon. <laughs> so really you, spectacular. So you really do your best work in a, in a space with trays with, with that section. Uh, sure. Yeah. This, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Once the you do the other. same layout. Yeah. Um, that's right. That's right. That's so. That's a pretty interesting kind of lineage there with Imola Scott and Wes Jones, and then Renzo, kind of right from the beginning. What did you gather from him most? Did it feel pretty different, you know, or or did they all kind of go together? Yeah, no, it felt very different. I mean, Renzo, I, what I gathered most, I think, was his kind of sense of charm. Um, hey. So this was back when we we don't see this much anymore, but you know. Clients coming to an architect studio, right? Coming to an office to have meetings. I mean, now we're we're doing this all day long, sitting staring at computer screens. But I was sitting actually quite near. I was on the tray right near his desk, and so he there was a, a, a table nearby where he would kind of sit with clients that would come in, and it would happen, you know, with some frequency. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I, I just recall those conversations and being the fly on the wall with him, you know, speaking to to some of these clients about these large institutions that he was designing all over the world. And I mean, he's just the most charming individual and just really getting the clients comfortable with what he was proposing in a really super conversational way. I think that was a great takeaway. So he was able to translate like exactly what he wanted to do to a client in a super simple conversational manner and get them excited, right? Just by talking about it, uh, waving his hands, showing him some sketches and just really kind of selling what he was interested in. So that that left the mark that made a great impact on me. Um, hmm. And then, you know, he's just surrounded himself with incredible, an incredible staff, great partners, um, you know, inquisitive people that were super warm and welcoming and kind of encouraging you to get out, get out of the studio go see amazing things that were, they were kind of around the studio. So it was, a, it was just a really cool experience. Had a lot of, had a lot of great people there. Yeah. I mean, I perked up when you said Wes Jones, like his drawings were pretty influential for me in, in undergrad. Like I remember that, you know, like discovering that and being like, Oh my God, like I want to do this, you know? And then that idea of kind of going with, with Renzo and, and like most of those kind of sectional sketches and things are his right that where he's able to communicate those ideas so clearly and kind of simply but just that like architects touch and i love that on your on your guys website now that you know a lot of drawings and a lot of nice sketches and things that architects are seeming to take off their website more and more or just not doing but um yeah like how that's continued uh so jason then well i guess i guess for both of you guys so you're finishing up there isn't an idea for you guys that you're like, you stayed close in, in the alphabetical order and you're, you're, you're thinking that the, the plan is to start something and maybe go off and learn some things first and then come back together? Or 
Was that not really the plan? Well, there was a joke in that first studio, running joke that um, that this was going to happen. You know, I think people, you know, our friends kind of singled us out because we were, you know, we had a little bit of fluency, you know, relative to mm. everybody else. And so there was, uh, I don't know if you recall Zach, but there were little jokes and comments made. I think prior to coming into, I thought they were joking about something else. Yeah. Oh, you know, they're, like, they're oh, laughing, yeah. laughing, well, with you, not at you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, they were just laughing at us. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> I guess they took it the right way because, <laughs> but um, you know, before coming in, I was working. Uh, I mentioned for my professors, Marion Weiss and my client for Weiss and Freddie. Uh, yeah. And so my first glimpse of architecture and of practice was a partnership. Mm. And it was a, a, a small boutique uh, size at the time. It was 11. So mm. I think that was immediately was left in my memory and understanding of what it might mean to me practice architecture. And then you get in and then you, you know, see folks like Kurt Zogdenrow and other partnerships. And so you're I, like, for me, I'm sort of drawn to, okay, well, how does that work? You know, going forward. And then I don't think it really happened until I got exact because of the, uh, the co-op uh, and time in Italy, he actually stayed uh, an extra semester. Then I left, graduated and left first because I was just mm. on the normal track. And it wasn't until, oh gosh, I mean, we were working. Um, you know, he had gone to California and it must have been about at least two years in, you think, Zach, to working that we, we yeah. did that. We started channel. doing some work together. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, it started with Zach. She had a friend who you know, was interested in designing a, a guest unit at ADU. Um, and so he reached out. And so we started doing that by coastal thing of emailing mm-hmm. files uh, and moonlighting after after work. Yeah, which, which was interesting because Jason was on the East Coast and I was on the West Coast. And, you know, we were coming home from a full day work and kind of plugging in after, you know, after you eat dinner or whatever. And Jason would have a three-hour head start. So he would get home and work on Eastern Standard. And, you know, by the time midnight rolls around, you know, he passes the file off to me and it's about nine o'clock in San Francisco. And I'm just plugging in and he goes to bed and, and I work on it for another three or four hours and, and then I go to bed and we kind of repeated that cycle for quite a while. So we, we did a handful of small projects. Mm. I don't think any of them actually got built, which is probably a very good thing. Mm. Uh, but it was a good practice, right? Like we were still in kind of stay up late, you know, grad school mode and eager to, you know, to kind of take on as much as we could. And so the, the time zone really worked in our favor in those very early years. Which is pretty exciting. I don't know, Adam. Maybe maybe you're finding that with your partner, who sounds like is on the East Coast. Sometimes I feel like morning meetings are more difficult because he's he's wide awake and prepared, and I'm you know I'm just catching up. Yeah, yeah. took me a while to figure out. Like you let's put it push it back to like 10, 10 o'clock my time. You know, the other thing I'll add is after grad school, I I also worked for a firm that was it was two part. It was a partnership as well. It was at the time it was Riders Marvel. Now there's they've kind of gone their separate ways. And, you know, Zach was at Aiden and Darling. So mm. I think we've seen that model and whether it was just by osmosis or, you know, it were real determination. Like I believe that that was, at least for me, it, it was a, it either a better or the right way for me to, to practice. And I think it's good even just given now that I look back at my, my personality, it's probably good to have a little bit of a balance and counterweight. Balance, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Were you at Koning Eisenberg as well then, Jason? Oh, Koning Eisenberg. That's right. Koning so Eisenberg. You got another partnership. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So I uh, left New York in 2010. My wife was from Los Angeles. And we had a couple of kids and we were outgrowing New York or she was outgrowing New York. And so we moved and I, I worked for a year there as well. And mm. that was also nice. Again, another husband and wife team. So kind of good to see. Actually, at the time, even Steve Gang was husband and wife too. Right? Yeah, partners. that's true. So, so you did, how, how many years of this sort of moonlighting did you do? And, and what did it look like sort of first day you both quit your jobs and hang up the shingle? How long did it take? Well, I mean, it was, um, it was a process for sure. You know, as I mentioned, we, we probably worked on a couple of projects that didn't, didn't really go anywhere. Um, and I think we were both totally fine with that. 
And that was maybe over the course of a couple of years. And then it was really around the time Jason and family kind of relocated to the West Coast that we got, let's say, more serious about it. And so I think, you know, Jason landed in L.A. I started working with Gunnar Geisenberg. And within about a year, there was a good uh, exit point, if you will. And so we had managed to pick up a project back in New York, actually, hmm. that was a, a kind of a loft remodel for some friends. And so that was the point at which I think when Jason got through a quick project at Koenig Eisenberg that he was able to say, look, I could take this on, you know, you keep your job uh, and I'll take this one on and we'll work on it together. And so that was kind of how it really uh, initiated was he launched and I kept doing the moonlighting for another probably year until we could build up mm. enough work to support both of us. And, you know, I think the folks that we were working for at the time were, were super supportive to kind of see us trying to get something started on our own. So they were, they were sympathetic to what we were trying to start and, you know, generous and helpful. And that was kind of nice to, nice to experience, nice to see. But, you know, one project then just started leading to another. And before you know it, we were able to, to kind of support the two of us on it. How many kids did you have at that point when you started it? And how old were they? I had two. They were a three and one, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, you had, time, you had a ton of free time. You're like, hey, let's start this. Let's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think one thing we're really grateful for is the, the timing for the entire trajectory in general has been very, very, very generous. Like I was, I was months away from probably getting laid off. Mm. So the only thing that kept me on was there was three more months of construction or, or two more months. And I was the only one staff. So they couldn't fire her until I was, was gone. And they were letting people go still. Mm. And but we were in a position to, to suggest that, you know, hey, let's split the time. They were good with that because it was going to alleviate on some mm. of their, their costs. And then after a while, it was getting heavy on our end. I just I told you, you don't need me anymore. You guys have finished this. And they were... So it was kind of a win-win in many ways and same as Hack Town. So. Yeah, and that was around 2010, maybe 2011. Um, 2011, yeah. Out of, yeah, the 08, 09 <laughs> recession. So it was, you know, in some ways a terrible time to do it. Uh, but in other ways, you didn't have a whole lot to lose. And, you know, there were there were lots of opportunities once we got out and, and kind of started making people aware that we were available. But yeah, it was an interesting time to to try and start a practice together. That's for sure. Yeah, that's interesting. So you, you came out and set up the company. How soon was it, would you say, until you got like a real project, you know, that, that was meaningful to you guys? Or was it kind of scrounging up like kitchen remodels for years? Well, I think the first project was meaningful. And I remember asking my old boss, not really you know, fully understanding like what we were maybe about to embark on, but he just said, so what do you need when you know you're ready? Um, so actually to ask one boss, what do you know when you're ready to be a dad? And he says, you know, you don't know, you just have a kid and then you're ready. <laughs> and so you were switching. Two years on. later, you're ready. Yeah. yeah you, you apply that. And the other one was, he was kind of looking at me funny. He's like, it's not that complicated. He's like, all you need is a, a project and a business card. And so I said, okay. And so look, well, Thankfully, the first project was a real project. You know, it was it was a viable project, right? It could support one and a half people. The loft project. Yeah, that was yeah. A, that was a real yeah. project. Yeah, and that's um, I mean, it's, we it's, did, yeah, it's it's on your website, right? The the Tribeca loft, like yeah, it's yeah, a great project. Yeah, I mean, we did have you know one or two like tiny little projects for you know folks we knew that just helped the cash flow and keep us. You know, we weren't making any money. I remember we did a renovation in Pasadena for. It was a three month thing that like, had to get done. Um, and it, I think we made like nine thousand dollars on that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah. you know. Yeah. But we were Yeah, but those were the early days. I mean, that yeah, that's how it worked, right? You were kind of scratching and clawing. And you know, we had these small we had a number of small little tidbits of projects, right? An outdoor kitchen here, a swimming pool over there, an interior kitchen or you know, some small renovation like that. But then Amongst those smaller projects, we did have a handful of, you know, kind of key, key big projects that were big for us at the time. And, and that Tribeca one was one of them. Probably the, the Dreams project was soon after that, Jason. I mean, that was an early kind of ground up house that was 
Well, the, the house here, the house that we're sitting in is was the next one, right? That oh, wow. the Tiburon house really was what uh, allowed us to really be independent and Zach to also cut, cut the cord. And it was what allowed us to uh, hire our first employee. So that was the the real next mm. thing is, you know, have, bring somebody into to work with us. And um, that was, so I think we've tried to be careful, or not careful, but uh, prudent with the growth and making sure that, the, you know, each building blocks, it's got enough to build on as we, as we go up. And that interestingly, that hire was, we were trying to find somebody up in Sausalito to work on this job together because that made sense. But the only person that we found that we felt like was a good fit and qualified was actually in LA. So we started like this and, and they were, he was zooming with Zach on that project hmm. for the duration. And so when did that project start? Like how, how far into the firm was it that, that first kind of big residential? It, was, it would have been 20, 2012. Wow. And I think we, we started the practice really in 2011. Yeah. So it was pretty soon thereafter. I mean, you know, obviously you guys had great backgrounds and a great kind of portfolio of work from different firms, but uh, yeah. How, how did that, how did that project come about that first great one? Well, as, as many of the first projects are right. Like we, we put together a, a friend and family mailer, right? Mm. Um, so we kind of put a, put a letter together, say, Hey, you know, friends and family, we're, starting an architecture practice and, you know, keep your eyes peeled for anything that, you know, mm. that might involve an architect. And that's a good idea. No. And one, one such lead of a few leads, uh, I think was this Tiburon house, which as it turns out was Jason's former college roommate and who, who had also tried the architecture studio, you know, started it with Jason and, and decided that, you know what, maybe I'll go and do something else. He, um, he ended up hanging out with those finance of, guys. Is that what he's, he's, he's one of those? He's much, he's too much work harder. Work yeah. Too yeah. <laughs> and found a great piece of property, you know, overlooking the bay. And so, yeah, he was sympathetic to our endeavor and was willing to kind of just dive into the weeds and dive in, dive into it with us. And, it, you know, it was certainly a process getting that one built, but yeah, a great, great anchoring project early in the practice that Jason said allowed us enough kind of leeway to, to grow things a little bit, right. To kind of make some investments in software and infrastructure for the studio. Um, and also make a few key hires in the early days to get it done. Yeah. But I mean, even th that just seems like such a, such a blessing even to have, to have a project that you can say, yeah, we believe in this and this is who we want to be. Right. Like I, I find that with so many of the younger firms that like it takes so long and how, how do you, how do you get out, get that thing out there of who you want to be without doing it and showing it. And it's like, yeah, you can, you can render those projects and you can do those things. And hopefully that gets the message out, but being able to have that project kind of year one seems like great launch pad. Yeah. I think for us, um, the combination of relationship and ex experience, it actually came dovetailed and came together really nicely and, you know, add timing to that. But you know, to be honest, I'd never worked on a single family project. Hmm. Um, I'd never detailed in, in wood, like wood hmm. stuff, until we started. And Zach was now coming in with great high-end residential experience. So I think the combination of that and you know, right project being at the right place, right time, that all allowed us to kind of move forward and stumble a little bit less. I mean, we all we all learned and made mistakes and stumbled, but there was like kind of a base level of there. Yeah. How do you explain kind of your your work and uh, sort of the the typologies or the focus of the firm of the firm now. That it, annoying question you get from everybody when you say you're an architect, oh, resident, yeah. commercial or whatever, but yeah. but yeah, what's, what's work, the yeah. focus? Yeah, I think we. I mean, okay. I guess Jake may have hit on it at the beginning, where we're very design center, mm -hmm. right? Like that's the first, that's the first kind of most important factor for us when a project comes in is okay. What what's interesting about this? You know, how well do we get along with the clients? Are they interested in kind of what we're, you know, do, do we have a kind of shared sense of purpose or goal for the project from a design standpoint, kind of out of the gates? And that's really crucial, you know, to kind of have this, the same footing with your client as you're kind of embarking on one of these projects, particularly in the residential world where it's a pretty personal decision for a lot of people. But from there, you know, it's an exploration of the location. What can we make out of where we're working? Um, what are the 
kind of attributes of the site that can be fantastic that you can imagine. You know, like this house we're sitting in, the view behind us, this client came to us and said, I can picture like floating in a glass box next to that oak tree. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the design idea that came kind of day one, right? And so to then be able to kind of work towards achieving that together, kind of at a conceptual level, but also at a super practical level, like, okay, this is a super steep hillside. Like, how are we going to actually achieve that? How do you hit that sweet spot on the site? So I think, you know, making sure we've got a great kind of, you know, design narrative story shared path with the client is key. Number one, that's always our focus. Uh, but then, you know, how do we, how do we kind of rethink what might be out there to really take advantage of what's in front of us from a kind of, you know, just site energy standpoint? Yeah. Well, and I, and I, and I sort of asked that, you know, Jason, like you said, you hadn't uh, done many single families. Like I was just sitting here way too late trying to do some research on you guys, admiring uh, all your houses uh, last night. Uh, just such, such beautiful work. And it's like, how much of that at the beginning is a focus and a strategy of saying, okay, here's, here's who we are, you know, and trying to lay that down on paper and saying, and we're going to make awesome single families. And that evolves into this and this and this versus like, Hey, let's get a good team around us and see, see where this, this rocket ship takes us, you know? I think it's, it's very much the latter. Mm -hmm. So if we start with our team, we've always tried to hire in a matter that is, is kind of controlled and sustainable, right? And find find the talent who we're comfortable, we feel like we can work well together with and they can contribute. And that first hire, I think, is exemplary of that. It wasn't um, like we need somebody up there, so just put someone up there. It's means find the right person. And I think that goes, and that's been the kind of mantra and the MO for hiring. And then after that, it, it is... It is design. Uh, I don't think we are wedded to only designing and working on certain types. It's just work is leading to work. And I think we've remained open to where that takes us. But I think there's a there's always an interest in designing, you know, different types of spaces and types and projects uh, and locations. I think once we just focus on the design aspect, it takes the pressure off or, or the self-consciousness of, oh, we haven't done this yet and our peers have already designed a museum or whatever yeah. it is. It's just, let's just make sure it's it's really great and we can be proud of it at the end of the day. Yeah. So um, talk about the Aspen studio. So so you're setting up setting up a base in, in Aspen, uh, have employees here in Colorado, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's super exciting for us. And that's been building over time uh, for years now, actually. And as, as Jason was alluding to, I mean, I think we are pretty pretty measured in how and when we try to add people to the studio and where that happens. And early in the practice, we had an Aspen project on Red Mountain, which was supported by, you know, having worked out there previously for me. And then I worked on an Aspen project uh, at Aidman Darling as well uh, when I was in their studio. So uh, we had a lot of experience out there and so I think that was like a 2013 project. And from there, you know, that took a while to complete and led to other work. And we continued to do that work from San Francisco and L.A. But an opportunity presented itself a few years ago of a person that was interested in, in coming to work with us uh, who was in the Roaring Fork Valley. Uh, so we hired him. And then we hired a couple of other folks and, you know, finally decided to take on a studio maybe a year or so ago. It's been great so far. So we have people there in the Valley that are accessible and available for, you know, last minute site visits, what have you. Then we keep a pretty good, pretty good amount of work going there. I think we have probably four or six projects in Aspen right now. Mm. So it's really turned into a nice kind of base. You know, over the last couple of years, the work has grown into other mountain towns too. So I think Aspen was a good kind of initial step, but you know, from there, it's been very translatable to places like Park City and Sun Valley and um, Lake Tahoe, some other kind of wonderful mountain towns where we're able to kind of translate the the work from, you know, from one of these locations to another. So, you know, we focus on a lot of single family residential projects, but they, they happen to be in a, in a lot of different areas. Um, and so we've been able to kind of translate what we were doing in Aspen just from like, not from a design sensibility so much as it's just like, okay, how do you put a team together in a place where you're, where you're not physically located? 
Mm-hmm. And can you replicate that in, in other towns? Um, and so that's been an interesting part of the practice over the last few years, too, is, is being able to kind of work into a couple of different locations. Yeah, I mean, in general, you know, it's just interesting of you guys being in different locations and and being able to hire remotely like before the pandemic, right? Like for us, it seemed we that was kind of a big stumbling block. But then the pandemic hit and we we're like, OK, everybody's doing this. It's a lot easier. What do you see kind of future future planning wise, you know, do you think that those kind of physical bases are important and you, you see them kind of growing in more locations or is it, it's sort of like, you know, we can be digital everywhere and don't need that. I think we're still big believers. We, we are believers in a studio based approach, which is, yeah, it's physical, but it, it also has to do with a kind of closeness of collaboration and, you know, we can do a frequent collaboration on like via Zoom. And, you know, Zach and I don't want to suggest that this is not an effective way because we built the entire office based on this, like he and I, at least. Mm-hmm. But I, I think we do believe in having place uh, and having a presence of location. And I think what's interesting for the Aspen studio is the challenge there will be how do we establish a presence in a culture and an involvement that is local because I think people still value that. Right. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's also the kind of larger entity mm-hmm. um, and not just like a little satellite. Yeah. Especially without one of you there. Right. Like it's, yeah. Are you coming into Aspen Fairmount? Yeah, we do. Um, I mean, at any given month, like one of us are usually there and sometimes other team members just because we do have a lot of work there. It's so much that it's sometimes a little bit weird when we talk to people like in the Bay Area or Los Angeles because all of our stuff is kind of outside of our backyards. And so mm-hmm. It's just a strange dynamic sometimes. Yeah. And then speaking of kind of community, Zach, how do you see that area, the Roaring Fork, compared you know, to when you work there at the CCY Forerunner, right? Like how has this sort of community changed and what is it like there? Like, I, I don't plug into that community as much as I'd like to. Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question. I don't know if I have a great answer off the top of my head, but um, I mean, I think the community when I was working there in the late 90s, early 2000s was was really strong. You know, we met with, you know, you, it was common to get together with other architects around the valley. And, you know, there was a, there was a local watering hole. Um, our CEO was actually in basalt at the time. I think the bar is still there, but it was like a place where, you know, people, other architects came together and, and had a drink on Fridays or whatever. But I knew a lot of architects in and around Aspen when I was working there. And, you know, some of those folks have now started their own practice. And a lot of them have also taken off um, and gone to other places. So it's kind of an interesting location in that, you know, it can be a little bit itinerant, but um, I think the folks that have decided to to make a home of it have found an amazing place that I think their their lifestyle is paramount uh, in their yeah. in their worldview, if you will. And architecture is a great outlet for creativity, obviously, um, but it can also kind of support this amazing high mountain lifestyle. So I, I think there's a great culture and personality to that valley that's unique that I learned kind of at an early age right out of, right out of college. And it's been really satisfying to kind of get back to it, right? But from a more kind of urban condition, mm. um, being, you know, in and around San Francisco. So, you know, we love we love our time when we when we get to go to Aspen. I, I like to travel there personally, you know, outside of work to just, you know, take my kids and enjoy everything that that comes with being there. So it's a it's a it's a great community right there. And it's interesting that it is it is quite different from the LA group and from the San Francisco group. In doing our office renovation, one of the biggest questions is where where is the ski rack going to hang? Yeah, you know? mm-hmm. and uh, that was that was commonly popping up in the in the inner office chat. But uh, I think they landed on a location. Figured it out. Yeah, they figured that one out. Well, cool guys. You know, I I um I had seen your work work pop up a little while ago, and then Morgan Brown from your office reached out to me and and got us together here and and uh yeah i just i really appreciate a just the, your work and the quality of the work and the rigor and the like i said the this the drawings and the rendered sections especially and and the the things you're kind of doing and then you know 
selfishly being, I feel like about eight years behind you, like looking ahead to you guys and like, okay, how do we, how do we do this? Let's, let's get this done. Like, like these guys, you know, I, it's cool to be looking at you guys in that way. And then, uh, yeah, it's excited to see you moving into Colorado. And I think, you know, rising tides raise, raise all boats here and, and, uh, just helping to elevate the, the scene here and things good for all of us. So look forward to seeing around some more and, uh, staying in touch. So thanks for coming on. Sounds good. Thanks for having us. Thanks for what you're doing with the podcast. Yeah. Thanks for having us. You can visit architecting.com. That's architect-ing.com to see images from this week's guest. And please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts. Have a great week and keep connecting. Hi, I'm Eli. This show is made by my mom and dad and these people. Heidi Mendoza. Emily Child. Fernando Queiroz. Zach Huff. Trevor Notzko. Aaron Best. Kyle Brunner. Rob Cleary. All right, let's get a coffee. See ya. Now let's get to the real stories. Oh. Real stories. Okay. Well, I forgot that Morgan connected up. That was nice of him to reach out to you. Yeah, and I we both went to Kansas State, but I think... I don't think yeah, we overlapped okay. at all, but I think he just knew of me or something. I, I've never met him, but he, he's been messaging me. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Kansas State, Kansas State seems to have a great program. We've seen a number of resumes come through. I think since Morgan joined, now we're kind of on the, on the Kansas State track, mm. but uh, seems like they're doing some good stuff there. A lot of good, a lot of good portfolios coming mm-hmm. out of there. Yeah. I, I think so. You know, it's kind of funny when you've been gone so long and go back and there's only a few professors left. But was there any um, any of those prompts that you had had good answers to? I always feel bad when there's when there's two guests and like it feels as sort of abbreviated in some ways trying to get both of you in. But any any good stories or anything? <sighs> Let's see. I mean, I'm I'm always interested in. I think like you, Adam. Probably. I, I mean, I appreciate the fact that you started a podcast as a probably to just get out there and talk with a lot of different yeah. folks, right? I think it's a cool, it's a cool format, and I think you know it's it's one that a lot of other people would have loved to have done. But I think having the opportunity to to chat with people in Colorado, I'd be curious to hear like like what your temperature is on Colorado architecture, and like what's I, I've listened to a couple of your podcasts. Mm-hmm. And look forward to going deeper, but I'm curious like what what you're finding relative to the Colorado community. And you really need like, you know, strength there coming through and being consistent or are you seeing that there's something that's like a missed opportunity or what's your takeaway? Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I feel in a lot of ways, I feel like I'm pretty new here. I've only been here like six years, I think. And so like I'm getting I'm getting the history from like people's stories and things, but not necessarily knowing it, you know, and it seems like there's just this huge everyone says like it was a cow town, you know, 10, 15 years ago and like kind of trying to figure out what that means a little bit. And then, and then I think, you know, there's these few firms of studio B arc 11 CCY that were trying to, trying to push things. And I think kind of like pulling, especially from kind of Pacific Northwest, kind of Olson Kundig kind of, and, and now, you know, that's becoming more and more prominent and they're getting work. Right. And then there's a lot of young people coming in and, and starting these small firms that are kind of flying under the radar a little bit. And I think we'll be, you know, getting a lot more work in the next 10 years here or so, but you know, there is that sort of wood and black steel and glass kind of that's taking over everything. And and I've been asking myself a lot lately of just like kind of what's next or what's what's the iteration of that or like, you know, because even just to get that is pretty good, you know, like to be able to get a project where a client is interested in something like that. But then sort of like, how do we take it further? And and how do we diverge a little bit from the sort of Olson Kundig West Coastness and what's the what's the Colorado kind of essence? But it seems like Colorado is always kind of borrowed the architecture right it's pulling in the kind of victorian kind of stuff of the gold rush and the silver rush and and then pulling in things and so it is interesting kind of what is this place and 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 just in general i you know there's not i would say there's not necessarily kind of like that 
Olsen Kundig figure or uh, Rick Joy figure that's kind of leading it here, you know, and not a nationally well-known kind of thing, uh, which is always sort of interesting because when you get here, you know, there's a lot of good work going on, but it's not very well known and kind of like what what's going on with that. More questions, I mean, you, less answers. Yeah. Yeah. When you mention that, it makes me think that in a good way, not all of Colorado, but at least some of these mountain towns are a bit like laboratories. You know, people say, oh, well, it's going to all be mountain architecture. What is that? And I think there's this tendency to think that it has to be like a unified and look like something. Mm -hmm. and at one point, it probably did. And it was the vernacular was resultant of climactic conditions or whatever it is. But now it's, I mean, it's such a beautiful place such a destination for so many people from around the world that it starts to feel like this laboratory. I mean, we were Zach and I, we, we look at the houses just get taken down and put back up or even gutted and redone, even though it was just built. And it's in a, you know, in one ways it's, it's sort of wasteful and not so sustainable, but in the, if you kind of ignore that for a second, it's almost like this laboratory where different people are coming in and, with their clients and trying new things. And I think that in isolation is kind of interesting versus seeing it as needing to conform to whatever mountain modern is or mountain. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that kind of sparks a thought that I've been having too. It's like when we first started, you would ask the question out of about what has changed since I was working there, you know, maybe in the nineties to now. And, you know, I think a lot of the projects, in the mountains were, were really set up as these kind of showcase homes that were like parked in front of the view, you know, with like this gabled interior set up to like this big fixed glass moment, you know, like mm -hmm. pointed at Ashley Mountain or Mount Sopris or whatever. And that was, I think, consistent with what I was seeing when, when I was working out there, right? It was, it was very much about like being inside and viewing the exterior. And I think when we, when I first started working on a project out there, um, with Adam Darling, you know, one of our sensibilities was to like turn the other way, right? So you're you're on Red Mountain, obviously staring across the valley at Aspen Mountain and Aspen Highlands and you know, these great and wonderful mountain peaks. But there's this upslope activity that could be, you know, maybe different but also interesting. And so can we open the house more? Can you bring a different sensibility from a kind of use and experience standpoint that kind of integrates like you know, the upslope side in a way that had been, you know, integrated previously. And so that is something with these hillside sites that I think gets really interesting architecturally is when the house kind of is this, this kind of middle point between this amazing view on one side and this kind of interesting landscape on another. And so we, you know, ever since then have been very diligent about trying to use both sides and, and really open the house up and kind of have this flow through indoor outdoor opportunity that, actually works in the winter oftentimes as much as it works in the summer just given the, the solar exposure that's out there so i do see like a shift in like how people are occupying you know the land from when i was out there working to now and i think that's that's been a really nice development that's been really exciting to be to kind of to see yeah we're kind of like moving from like building as image almost right to like building as whatever an operation of of like yeah let's not just point it at the point the binoculars at the biggest thing but like focusing on whatever else the site has to offer or different types of moments maybe yeah see what what uh you guys got a good uh cocktail story from your times at the gsd with those from those hot dog parties or whatever you have going on over there and <laughs> the beer beer and dogs beer and dogs yeah i got to visit for one of those once it was fun we had a I don't know if they do it anymore, but there, there was always a good, annually, there was a good, like, freshman class, like, production that gets put on at a, mm. at a late night beer and dogs. It was a lot of fun. The, you know, it was kind of the, the culmination of all the beer and dogs for the year would end with this big, you know, production that gets put on by the, by the newest student. Like a song and dance? Those were good memories. Well, that was a big, it's a yeah. big kind of, yeah. Yeah. Skit with a they're sort of parodying all the professors. Uh, and nice. yeah, kind of uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, anything crazy happened there that you can recall? I mean, the whole thing was kind of crazy. It's hard to. I mean, I think just the, the like 
commitment of all of these students at that place is, is pretty intense, right? I mean, one of one of my stories about the GFD was, didn't, I think we sold our car when we moved there. And so, you know, walking to and from campus at four in the morning, a lot of times, and walking home from studio, right? I think it was about four in the morning and I walked past this bakery. Like I lived next to this mm. bakery on the corner. And what was so memorable was that I would be going home when the, you know, the baker was there with their big mixer in this, you know, big kind of picture window, starting the dough for these incredible scones that they would make at like 4.30 in the morning. And I would, I would be like, oh man, I'm going to go sleep for a couple hours and come back and get one of those. But just the level of commitment that students brought to doing that. Like, I don't, I don't really know what the motivation is other than like some collective, like energy that pushes everybody to, to kind of be that insane and productive. And that was really the, the kind of first two years of the GSD was, was that experience. Yeah. I went to Yale and you know, you, right. It's like, that's the thing that surprised me most. Maybe it was just the quality of people. It's like, if you took the best person at each of your undergrads and put them together and it's just like. I had to get used to failing, right? Like it was like, I could only do about 60%. And it's like, I can't succeed everywhere. I got to choose where and who I'm going to let down. And yeah. Was Bob Stern still there? Yeah, he was. He was still Dean, yeah. I remember I went uh, for one lecture uh, when I was, this is right out of college, before I applied there. And I was, I was kind of shocked and the lecture ended and, you know, Bob got up on stage and, and he was like calling out students by name, like, hey, Jeff, what do you think about that? I was like, wow, this is like Bob Stern. And <laughs> like first name basis knows every every kid's name there. I don't know, it was pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, hey, I'll just he, remember was, had he already started on his on his uh martinis? Was that why he was up there? Yo, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just remember Boston being so cold. I mean, I was used to it, but man, like walking home and falling under the covers. Was, was pretty memorable. I also I occasionally I would drive at night and come back. And I had a lot of mornings where I'm still asleep and my wife is like shaking, like, where the hell is the car? Because I can remember where I parked the car. It was so late That's now funny. and it was like so delirious. We're street parking it. It's like somewhere out there. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I mean, it's it's been a I mean, it's been a it's been a really good um good development in we're, we're, I was talking to Zach, or who was I talking to? I felt like we're in like version 3.0 of the office right now. Hmm. Like the first version was, you know, us with our, you know, sleeves rolled up and we're doing all the drawing, and, you know, phone in hand at the same time and talking to the client and clean scrubbing the toilet and, you know, all that stuff. And then, and then all of a sudden COVID happened. And that was that. And, and now it's interesting where we're in a um, mode where, Studios grown enough, and there's enough projects that we can't be that deep into everything. Mm. We still sit in and we critique and we still sketch and lob ideas out there. But you know, it's this kind of critic mode, which is also interesting. Yeah, I, I am really interested in like in the in the partner dynamics. And you you went through and saw these other partners, but then like where are you at Rogers and Marvel, right? Like they broke up, right? Uh, so you saw like successful and maybe unsuccessful. Did you guys come in? Were you pretty similar, like skill sets and lanes when you came in as partners, or was it pretty complementary and different? I think I think Jason has always had a leg up on me when it comes to things that are perhaps yeah. non-architectural. Mister Finance background has mm -hmm. um, definitely come in handy more than once, right? So I do think it's important with a partnership that you kind of identify like what you're what you're good at, what you like to do, and hopefully those aren't always going to be the same thing. Like if we need a really good spreadsheet, like Jason's your guy, you know, that's not going to be that's not going to be me. Like it's he, so nice of him to wonders. pass that off to you, oh. Jason. Yeah, that you, that you get that. Yeah, right? and now he gets a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of joy in building those. But no, I mean, I think you have. I mean, I, I agree. I think the partnership is is the key to our success for sure. I don't think either one of us would have been as successful individually right so i think figuring out a way to make that marriage work and then sustain is critical i mentioned earlier i was at this this event last night and i also ran into 
former bosses. And I was kind of, you know, a, a partnership. And I was marveling at like, and they're, you know, kind of like you were just mentioning, Adam, how we're kind of, you know, eight or 10 years ahead of you. They're kind of 10 or 12 years ahead of me. I was, you know, on my drive home kind of marveling at, you know, how happy they looked, you know, talking to each other, you know, putting on the song and dance, like in front of the crowd, mm -hmm. um, kind of running the show. Right. And, um, and I think that's really important with a partnership is that you've got to figure out a way to like go the distance and, um, stay excited about working together and allow each other enough space to, to kind of do what they want to do while also providing the right level of criticism. You know, in, in our practice, we kind of do that. We definitely start all the projects together hmm. and we're on all the early meetings together. Um, and at a certain point, one of the, one of the principals kind of becomes principal in charge on the project. And at that point, maybe the other principal is a little bit more the, the kind of visiting critic, if you will. And yeah. I think that's a pretty, you know, successful model where you kind of work together in the beginning and then you give some space to run a little bit. That's worked well for us. And now with some really talented folks in the office, you know, that makes it even more interesting from a kind of design dynamic. Um, and I would say neither Jason or I are super dogmatic in like where the idea comes from. And, you know, we expect everybody to bring their pencil to the table and, and start designing from the beginning. So it, it's very much a kind of group design collaboration, you know, with, with a kind of shared goal at the outset, which makes it a lot of fun. Yeah. I, I think with like my partner, we were kind of like, oh, you're passionate about design. I'm passionate about design. Yeah. Let's let's start a firm together. And then we got in there. Yeah. We're like, well, I want to do that. I want to do that. It was like just kind of our lames were just smashed on top of each other and trying to like figure out how to peel it apart. And I think I'm figuring out that it's more and more, it's kind of just, we need a bigger workload. So we're not on top of each other on like the one project <laughs> we have or whatever. And so like the more kind of projects and where we can't, again, yeah, be working on it all the time together, you know, is, is helpful, but. Oh, yeah, that reminded me of a story at, at Piano's office where mm. there was one guy that always drew the floor plans and then another guy that always drew the sections, right? Mm. And they were kind of the top, two of the top partners. And, and it was just interesting to watch, right? Like one would literally be there, like taking a new project and developing the plans by hand. And then the other person, you know, one desk over, same project, only working on the sections. Hmm. And like, that was a good way for them to like compartmentalize, right? And so they weren't kind of designing on top of each other, but then those two things came together and formed, you know, this kind of incredible building. But it was, it just hmm. stuck with me that like, okay, all you're going to do is sketch floor plans and all you're going to do is sketch sections all day long. Hmm. They just had one glass partition between them and they could just put all their drawings up and be <laughs> sketching on either side. And yeah. Right. Uh, that's fun. It's, it's neat. When we started, I remember talking to a few people. I don't know if I shared this with Zach, but at the time, I thought it felt like we were pretty similar. And he probably had been far from it, right? But uh, <laughs> it felt like we were similar. And so I was a little bit concerned just in the back of my mind. Like, oh, man, you know, they always tell you you got to be, you know, complimentary and make up for the other's lack. But whether or not it was true, I think that the way the studio was set up, and you know, sadly, we've never sat in an office together. I kind of hmm. wish we had one space, like one really spectacular studio. But um, the silver linings, maybe that kind of also gave us enough personal autonomy that, you know, you don't hit the, the point where you feel like you're in each other's hair all the time. You know, you just hang up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That and just, you know, kind of you know, constantly reminding, um, you know, yourself that, you know, this is, this endeavor is hard. I mean, you need a lot of different ideas and to get there and, and trial. I think one thing that Zach does really well is, is sort of like dedicated to that, like the pursuit until the very end. Like it never stops, right? <laughs> it's like, sure, let's, let's try it again. Another option. And, um, you know, he's, He's a little bit more uncompromising in that, in a good way. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I, you know, I will get impatient and be like, okay, we need to move on and like build a thing and move on and shelve that and let's let's get somewhere. And not that we don't get anywhere. It's just we sort of bring that together, and then I and I think it it evens out well. And so 
you know, I, there have been times when I'm on the job site and I'm sometimes I get kind of soft with builders and like, yeah, we could probably do that. And, you know, if I already made this mistake of second guessing what we've drawn or, you know, I've, I thought we should do because it seems reasonable and it's going to get it done faster. And then like I walk away in the back of my head and I hear, <laughs> oh my God, is that going to never tell them to rip that thing out? Like, yeah. Right right? And so it's reminding yeah. myself that and, you know, do a little bit of both. I'm the Jason of, of our partnership. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 So it's interesting. Oh, that's cool. Well, cool. You're still teaching right now? Oh, yeah. I haven't taught. I've taught like, I haven't taught a studio since my daughter was born. She's three. And so mm. I, I've been teaching like kind of seminars and things like that sometimes. But yeah, trying to focus on the focus on the company. But yeah, we we I feel like we finally just got like our first big, like awesome house up in Boulder mm. that it seems like the client's like, yeah, just do it. Like do it more, do it. And so that's been a nice, a really nice mm-hmm. milestone, it feels like. So we're like early concept on that. And then, you know, just a smattering of like renovations, additions, things like that around everywhere, Philadelphia, Connecticut, Kansas, Colorado, kind of at that point, not there yet, but thinking like, eh, it's almost enough to like hire somebody, but, you know, getting that good collection mm-hmm. of like freelancers together to kind of have flex, flex help, sure. but still drawing everything and yeah yeah it seems like the the borders have kind of opened up from a like where can my architect be standpoint uh and we've seen not a lot lately and i think it's you know just a function of like more imagery being out there available to a broader public right of like what what's amazing architecture what can we be doing and coupled with just the state of technology allowing people to like reach out so easily and, and imagine working with somebody that might be in Connecticut on a project in Kansas or something. So I think that's, that seems like a newish development from just a, this, the scale of architecture in our country is that I think you're going to be seeing people being capable of like crossing state lines a lot easier to do projects. So you may, you know, you know, which is what Jason and I have been working on this whole time. It's like, okay, we're located in these places, but a lot of the projects are all over the place. And so then what does that mean and how do you, you know, how do you kind of own the responsibility of getting the thing built well from a mm-hmm. distance? So you know, proves to be a challenge for sure. So it'll be kind of interesting to see how that is that gonna lead to a lot of challenges, a lot of problems, or is that like a, a great angle on development for architecture to take, right? Yeah. Well and even to your point of like people can get hired from anywhere, you know, like went to a architecture conference a few months ago and they were, you know, you get the marketing person and they're okay what does your firm do? And you're like, well, I'm good at design. And they're like, no, you need something more specific. Right. And you, you know, and it's like, but we all want to just say that like, we're, we're great at design and obviously others are better than others. But from that response where you guys were saying, yeah, we're, we're design centered, you know, and we can, you can break it down and talk about it, but it's hard in the beginning. Right. I mean, it's like to say, yeah, we're great at design kind of without the portfolio of work or, you know, yeah. and how to differentiate yourself. Like, you guys run into that and, and kind of have you figured it out and you can tell me the answer? I don't think we figured it out, but I go back to what I, what I learned from Renzo, right? Like he's the most charming mm. salesman I've ever, you know, one of the most charming salesmen I've, I've met, right? Like he's able to communicate these kind of crazy ideas in a really simple way and then get people to buy into it. You know? mm. I think that's a real talent and that, you know, if you look at all the great architects and designers out there, like they're able to, successfully communicate their idea in a way that's not, that doesn't make them sound as crazy as the idea might be, right? Mm-hmm. So if they can, you know, if it, you know, being able to put it on somebody else's terms to get them comfortable, or, or if it's just your passion for the idea can be convincing, you know, yeah. from time to time. But the tricky part is, you know, without the portfolio to back it up, it's, it's the classic chicken and egg conversation. Certainly that's one of the challenges of starting, starting your own practice is not having anything to back it up right mm-hmm. yeah I, mean, I think in the end if you can if you can make them feel better about what they're attempting to do than they can themselves like that's a, that's a really great way to to instill a little bit of confidence and if you can uh, you know we have one Corey who always says look when this stuff's being fun i'm just not gonna, I'm gonna stop doing this like what's the <laughs> point it's about the fun right and it's an inherently difficult and challenging and risky endeavor but yeah, how, how are you going to 
how are you going to make it so it's the highlight of their day? We've got a pair of clients who come home, they, or two glasses of wine, they turn on Zoom, like, what do you got? This is has to be the high point of our day. So mm. let's go. <laughs> yeah. Um, if we can keep doing that, then I think we'll, we'll all um, produce good products and stay in business. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Well, cool. Uh, yeah. Let me know if you guys are in Denver ever and want to grab a drink or it's around, around review times. We'll get you in on a jury. Have you, have you been down to see you Denver much or? No, I have not. I, that would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, yeah. That would be getting, great. You're getting better and better. I like that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll let you know, um, in the fall, okay. their States, but yeah. 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 Let, us, let, us, yeah. let us know if you're ever in California. Yeah. 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 Seems like right. maybe you're going to have like a Aspen opening of the office or something soon, or Morgan was saying something about that, like a party. Yeah. More than it's trying to get that get that uh, ramped up. So if we can if we can get them to organize it, then yes, we will. <laughs> Sounds good. But no, we I think we should actually. I think it'd be great. And, yeah. uh, we'll we'll certainly send you an invite <laughs> if it happens. Yeah, that'd be um, cool. I I've been trying to get like a a podcast like happy hour going out in Aspen, but e. with kids is you know it's just hard to get out there. But yeah, yeah, so yeah. sometimes. Yeah, my first my first listen of yours was the uh, the Harry Teague one. Uh, he's, he's one of those guys that I think every architect out there kind of points to as as right as still going in a good way. It was cool to hear his. I actually didn't know his background that he was. He went out there to work for you know the early modernists that were out there building Aspen Institute and stuff. Herbert sure. Bayer and those guys. But his like grandfather was like this um, super famous industrial designer in New York, industrial and like he had this design. lineage of like design that I didn't know about. Yeah. And then he's like hanging out with like yeah. Hunter S. Thompson yeah. and getting getting his <laughs> right. lights shot out by him and like yeah. yeah. I mean, there's some great stories in that town if you find people that are old enough to tell them. We we work with a builder out there who is just like Mister Mister you know 1960s 1970s Aspen stories. Um, you know, worked as a lumberjack before he was a builder, kind of thing, and just some amazing amazing old stories and Hunter Thompson usually pops up in one or two of the stories. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah it's a, a lot of characters on the ground there in Aspen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks guys. Good. Sounds good. Good, good Friday. Good. See ya. Okay. All right. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Yo, Alexa, play the plug podcast. My boy, Rudolph, enjoys an immersive audio experience. Do you feel me? Ho, ho, ho. With Echo Studio, we can listen to any podcast or song from Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and others. Click the link in this episode description. Santa. <laughs> Check out my podcast. <laughs> Damn, even the Grinch has a podcast. Merry Christmas, ho. Ho, ho. Thank <laughs> you.